And I asked some audience member last week to ask me questions and figured it'd be fun to just every Monday hop on from one to one 30 or maybe one to 2 PM, depending on how crazy it gets. And you guys can ask me any questions. Now we're live on Instagram. As I mentioned, we're also live on YouTube and Facebook and all these other channels. My producer, Eric is actually managing the back channel. So if you want to ask me any questions live, feel free. If you are on Instagram, you want to jump into the chat, let me know. Even if you want to share video, I will bring you on, just raise your hand. You can ask me any questions. I will answer it live give you the rundown and my opinions into what's happening in the real estate world from a sales and marketing perspective or from media. So prime real estate is obviously in the real estate business in London, Ontario, Canada, surrounding area. I have access to some incredible mentors and people around me that have taught me. Oh, so much. What's up, Alex. Hey, Taylor. Nice to see all of you here. And I'm just trying to share my network with you, right? I'm always on the hunt for knowledge for this business, for our media business, for the production team, the agency, everything that we do. And, you know, I just feel like I'm a people connector and I like answering questions. Benitez, what's up, brother? Thank you for joining us. So that's what the series is going to be about. So if you don't know me and this is your first time here, my name is Justin Conoco. I'm one of the owners of Prime Real Estate with my beautiful wife. We also own Prime Media, the real estate company handles all things, residential, commercial, investment, new construction, farms. No, I can't possibly do it all myself. I have an incredible team, some of the best operators on the planet. Ah, Sandeep, I'm from London, Ontario, Canada. Actually, if you really want to get to know me, I'm from Montreal originally, born and raised. So big city boy, ended up in this town and, you know, do cover a large territory. So we have a large team cover the whole southwestern pocket of Ontario. So we have team members that do Kitchener, Cambridge, all the way down to Sarnia. We do Lake Erie to Lake Huron. So Grand Bend, Fort Stanley. We partner with the best in the best in the real estate world from the investing side. We are partnered with the likes of Scott McGilvery from the TV show Income Property. Um, one of my mentors is Ryan Serhant. And again, I'm surrounding myself with people much smarter than me and trying to bring their thoughts into our world. Um, people like Donna, who is incredible. You know, I've spent a lot of time on Clubhouse with her. And one thing I'll say is consistency is everything in this business. So showing up every single week, asking questions, being humble and being afraid to ask people that are better than you to give you advice on things you're struggling with is what I'm all about. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I will go find the answer that is for sure. So on the media side of the business, you know, we kind of became like McDonald's where we made our own French fries. We were putting out a ton of video content, both short form, long form. We do digital, we do print, we do organic, we do it all in house. And I, I put my 10,000 hours in because that's what my background is marketing and advertising. But we saw an opportunity in the space that was underserved to get some incredible creatives together and kill it obviously for prime. But now we're doing work for people outside of the real estate industry. So trying to help those small business owners, maybe struggling through the times that we're going through right now, they have a hard time understanding how to create content, how to ideate, how to find their voice, how to put that into digital photos, videos, all the things, you know, you need to do. And then obviously run ads. Um, we'll share everything with anybody in any of those spaces. So feel free to ask me any questions relating to the real estate industry, media, marketing, or anything else. As I mentioned earlier, if anybody here is on the live and wants to jump in on Instagram, let me know. I will bring you right on. I'll show my whole audience who you are, hopefully get you a whole pile of new followers. And if you're on the YouTube, the Facebook or the live, blah, 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 sorry, the LinkedIn live stream, ask a question. My man, Eric will put his hand up and I will answer it live. I got to shut this one off at about 1.30, but we are going to run these weekly on Mondays from one till about 2 PM. So just put it in your calendar. Make sure you show up. It's Ask Justin. What up, Juan? We just sold the property for him. Congratulations. I'm so happy for you and the boys. These guys killed it. If you saw that incredible renovated condo on Fairfax, that was the one you missed your chance to buy it. But I'm sure they'll have other projects coming up. So I'm going to answer the very first question that I got asked. Let me just scroll to the top here. So do you believe the residential housing market, where that's now, is actually a good investment? Considering in some housing markets, values increased 100% in more than the last five years with such low interest rates as well. The housing market almost single-handedly holding the economy afloat, plus the government once the economy gets back to normal after the pandemic, the banks increase interest rates while housing prices, housing prices crash and ultimately make a purchase now without the intent of long-term, a bad idea. Well, to be honest with you, I think buying a house with a short-term Ambition is not necessarily the greatest idea if that's not your primary business. And what I mean by that is people, when they ask me about the housing market, 
That is a completely loaded question because it's what market and what area, what subsect, what type of real estate, and what's your plan. Now, when I say short term, I'm talking about somebody that's going in and doing a flip, right? You have a tight timeline. You got to get it on and off the market in very short order. You know how much renovations you're going to put into the property. You know how much you're trying to take out of it, but you are against the clock and markets can shift very, very quickly. So I'd say run your pro formas as if you got to hold the thing forever. If you're doing a flip, run a scenario where you got to put a tenant in that property if the market does crash because literally you flip a light switch and next week everything may come to a halt. Who knows? The government may turn around and say, you know, it's illegal to brush your teeth and then you can't leave your house or do anything at all. And real estate sales is not an option. So then what are you going to do? So a good real estate agent is going to run conservative analysis on the property for you and help you understand that the purchase you're making, things can change very, very quickly. Now to answer your question, do I believe it's a good investment? Yes, but I'm going to precursor that by saying, I don't care if the market's good or bad from the standpoint of, am I going to succeed or not? I think a lot of people are misconstrued that a real estate agent, you know, their entire livelihoods tied to the housing market. Well, fun fact, we can succeed in up markets. We can succeed in down markets and balanced markets. So it's, it's all good. If you look at it from the right perspective in a down market, it essentially means that the buyers are holding all the cards. So guess what? You work the buyers are still going to do a lot of business balance market. Well, it means that you have more of a standard of practice and you can do more business because you have some type of understanding. Matt LaMarche, if you're around, I'd love for you to hop on, uh, maybe just elaborate on some of these points as well. And I'll reiterate it to the rest of the audience here. Um, we're talking about, do you think the housing market is a good investment? Yes or no. If you're busy, don't worry about it, brother. But anybody on the Instagram live, you can put your hand up. We will collaborate on that channel as well. So going back to what I was saying, yes, I do think the housing market is a safe investment because historically, even go back a hundred years, it's virtually undefeated, even through recessions. We recently on our YouTube channel discussed, is the housing market going to crash with Ray Allen, right? Ray is obese and he had gave a very concise answer. And like I said, I'm going to have him answer it in the second. Oh, we do have Matt Lamarche coming on. Let's just see how this goes because we're live on like four channels right now. So we're going live with Matt Lamarche. Let's see if he can hear through the actual audio. This is going to be fun. We're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. Maddie, what's up, buddy? I'm good. Can, can you guys hear him? Eric, can you hear Matt talking to you? You hear? Probably need me to try talking. No, you're good, brother. We're good. Our audio levels are okay. So, yeah, Matt, what do you think? Is real estate a good investment right now? Like, people are thinking, you know, it's, it's skyrocketing like crazy. Do you think it's in a place where it's going to crash, or what's your short, long-term vision? Well, it's funny you just mentioned That's a great answer, Matt. I appreciate you popping in. I hope everybody on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn got value from that, even though you had to stare at my face. Go follow <laughs> Matt Lamarche. He's a beast. He spent a lot of time on Clubhouse ideating. He's doing great things as well. So thanks so much for popping in, Matt. It. All right. I'll see you, brother. All right. Let me see how this works. Well, this is pretty meta. Hold on one second, guys. I don't know. There you go. Uh, I don't want to end the stream. I don't want to kick him out. All right, so we're good. So yeah, going back to what Matt's point was, what Ray said in the podcast that we hosted around is the real estate market going to crash was even the guy that called the big short came on and he said, well, the market's in a really bad place. We're in a bubble, this, that, and the other, but he didn't give any real metrics as to what's going to happen if there was a crash. So keep in mind, if somebody's saying there's going to be a crash, does that just mean we're not going to increase 20 to 30% in value a month? Or does that mean that the housing market is going to regress and all of a sudden your house that was worth 1.5 or 600 is worth 700 or 300 interchangeably, right? I don't see any scenario short of what Ray pointed out. You know, everybody signs one-year leases for houses and then all of a sudden a whole bunch of sellers have to sell and there's physically no buyers on the market where the housing market is going to regress to a massive amount, right? Like Damon, when you ask this question, I know where you're at 
Ontario is Ontario. And there's a lot of people coming here regardless of COVID or not. So once immigration actually picks up again, even if the banks increase interest rate, it's actually going to push people to more affordable markets. So the secondary and tertiary markets will likely still see large increases in growth. You're going to see adaptation in the primary markets. Look at Toronto four months ago. Everybody was running for the hills saying, oh my gosh, Toronto condo prices are dropping. There was a brief window of opportunity for you to get into those markets. Now it's going crazy again. So I think real estate as an asset is fairly undefeated. Um, but again, nothing's undefeated from the standpoint of if your risk profile is higher than your willingness to invest in product, you just need to dial that in. So go back to what Matt said, personal investment is personal investment. So let me go to the next question here. I do have a couple. There was a lot of responses to these. So if you, oh, here we go. Is that a good idea to invest in a house nowadays in this lockdown? Depends on what you're trying to accomplish, right? Please tell me something about Vancouver. I don't know the Vancouver market. I know some wicked people down there. So check out Cameron Manning. If anybody's in the Vancouver market, let me know. We can definitely chat about it. I, Vancouver is a primary market, very similar to Toronto, Montreal, major metropolitan areas. I'd say contact people in your local market that are doing things in your area. I know from a housing standpoint, Canada is still very young in its journey from a real estate standpoint. So, you know, Toronto, Vancouver may seem expensive. Go to New York City, go to Tokyo, right? Look at what's happening in some of those markets. And I know some people that work in Tokyo markets and they say like every 20 years, there's these same cycles. The dollar amounts are just much, much higher. I um, mean, there was a point that was brought up last week around the disparity of wealth, which I do really think people, Montreal is the bomb. Yes, Olivier, it is the bomb. Um, you know, there's a disparity of wealth in this world that I wish wasn't there, right? I, I really truly want to believe that we can all share a table and all, you know, bring people up that are in a place where they're trying to accomplish something and, you know, these closed mentality not access to the opportunities. I'm trying to blow those doors open and really connect people with opportunities because some of the most amazing people that I know started from nothing, um, but neither here nor there, the disparity of wealth when market corrections do happen tends to lean in the direction that the people with a lot of money will come in and snap up properties that are on a 10% discount because they're looking for long-term buy and holds, right? So from an investment perspective, another thing I want to leave you with, and I'll, I'll go to the next question right after this, is, you know, if you are investing in real estate and you're doing a cash flow analysis and you look at a deal that's cash flow negative, quite often, you're going to look at a deal somebody else buys and you're going to say, they paid over market. That cash flow is negative. That doesn't make sense. By the time you pay your mortgage and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Not everybody needs a mortgage. It's happened with REITs over the last couple of years, right? They started divesting from their stock investments and buying hard assets, cash, right? Or overseas investments. There were some tax changes in overseas governments and they were trying to get money out and into other cities and in a hard asset. So they're coming in. They could care less if it's cash flow negative. They're long, long game. So understand that the metrics that you're investing with are not the metrics that everybody else is investing with. And I'm going to go to the next question here. Oh man, there's a lot of questions. Work-life balance. How do I find work-life balance? I don't, there's no such thing. I think, think of it this way. Um, I was given a lesson by a good friend of mine and our pastor. And he said, you know, picture you have five cups in front of you. You maybe you started with one cup and it was the Justin cup. It was Justin's world. And He's free in the world. That's the only one he's got to worry about. Then you get a job at Joe Cool's or Jim Bob Ray's, right? And now I have two cups. I have my work cup and I have my personal cup. And then I get married and I have a wife. Now I have three cups. Now I have a daughter. Now I have a business. Now I have five cups. I've only got a liter of water. I can pour that entire liter of water into my work cup. Guess what? My wife's probably not going to love me too much, right? And then I could pour all my water into, say, my work and my wife cup. And I can give up my health or my personal you know, fulfillment and the things that I'm passionate about. You got to find a place where your calendar reflects the life that you want. So the way that I'll answer this question is the exact same way that I coach a lot of the people that come here at Prime. The first email I send them is I tell them, list the things that you love to do and put those in your calendar first. Counterintuitive, because if you think about Prime, you probably think I'm a numbers guy and this place is like a boiler room and you got to hit your numbers and you got to hit your sales. That's not me at all. If you actually know me, I actually want you to fill your personal cups first, the time with your wife. You know, your time as a parent, your health and fitness, the things you love to do. If you like fishing, awesome. Put that in your calendar. Now let's reverse engineer it and see how much time you have left to do the important things in your work. And my mentor taught me, find, keep, do. So make sure you have time in your calendar to go in and find a little liter cola. Yes, Stuart, a liter cola. Find time in your calendar to 
you know, find business, right? So prospecting every single day, find time in your calendar to work on your systems. We just did that for an hour. We went over, you know, how we have conversations with people when we're doing brand consultations and, and putting out production, find time in your calendar to do the things that you said you're going to do. My weekly show every Monday, 1 to 2 PM is going to be here. So it's, it was my doing time. So now I'm looking at my calendar. I'm saying, okay, well, if I'm going to accomplish all of these things, what time do I have to accomplish them by so I can hold myself accountable so I can spend time with my wife, so I can play with my daughter and do all these things. So I would say, if you're looking to find work-life balance, you need to map it out. It needs to be visually on a calendar and then treat your calendar like Tetris. And this is the last asterisk I'll put on this one before I go into the next question is understand nobody's going to hit this 100% of the time. Anybody that tells you that they do is a liar, quite frankly, right? Even if you're hitting it 70% of the time, you're better than 90% of the industry. And I think that's the real, you know, trick of all of this. Sorry, I'm just going to click this real quick. You know, understand that you have your calendar. Understand that you're going to be shifting your time blocks. and hit them, that's okay. You can reorganize them. And then at the end of the week, reassess the week and say, did my actions map to my ambitions? And if they didn't reassess your ambitions, maybe your ambitions are different than your actions are actually leading to. And now that actually taught you that you're tracking to doing something else. And life is all about growth, not goals. So I'd say put it somewhere where you can see it visually, you know, move stuff around, but then don't stick to it. There's no reason to, right? Like last night, randomly, 10 o'clock at night, my daughter told me, woke up. And she's like, hey, I'm going to wake up at midnight. I was like, okay, why is that? She's like, we're going to go look for wolves. I'm like, Probably not something your mom's going to approve of. Probably don't want you waking me up at midnight. So let's put flashlights on our heads and let's go outside right now and go looking for wolves, right? Randomly sharing a story with you, but that was not in my calendar. I was going to be in bed at 10 o'clock. I was going to wake up at five o'clock. That was my calendar, but I shifted it because I prioritize my daughter. I, I want her to know that those moments to me are more important than any sale I could possibly have on the face of the earth. Right outside, we actually had fun. I had to tell her not to, yeah, thanks, Taylor. I actually tell her not to shine the lights into the neighbor's houses because it's 10 o'clock at night and they were going to call the cops for sure because we're running around looking for wolves in my backyard. But understand that you have the ability to adapt. Now, the cool thing is I go back to my calendar and the framework of what I want to accomplish. And today is on autopilot because I already did the work. I already knew the meetings I was walking into, the appointments I had to do and everything else too. So doing that work gave me the ability to have the freedom. Right. So I've got seven minutes left. I'm going to try and get through two or three more questions. We do this every Monday from one to about one 30. We'll expand on that with the amount of questions that I'm getting. If you want to ask any questions, feel free to DM me. Um, you can go on Instagram, justin.conical, probably the best place to reach me or on any one of these other platforms we're streaming on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube right now. Um, YouTube channel. I would actually say that's the best place to drop your question because we'll be able to categorize and organize it there. So go to YouTube, type in Justin Conical, hit that subscribe, hit that notification button, and then drop your question. I promise you, I will answer it. And I'll give you a shout out. I want to engage our community. There's so many amazing people that are here. Paul McElraith, amazing guy. Thank you, Paul, for joining the feed. You know how much I love you as well. So here's a fun question. What do you think about the egos in the real estate industry? Um, yeah, <laughs> this is an interesting question. So I would say, don't believe your own hype. Ego in real estate is the quickest way for you to lose. It's a business that is very hard to get into, despite what you may think in the media. It's actually not easy for real estate agents right now. So I'll dig into that first, then we'll go to the second part. Everybody's reading that the housing market's on fire. It's one of the only things you can do right now. So a lot of people are like, oh, I'm just going to get my license. I'm going to become a real estate agent because it looks like so much fun on Justin Stories or HGTV or whatever else. It's just a job. I don't care if you're flipping burgers, you make shoes, you do coffee, you make coffee beans. It's all sales and marketing, right? You're trying to obtain consumers. You're trying to execute, provide customer service. And thanks, Charlie. Um, you know, you're trying to just do a job, right? You're trying to maintain relationships and grow. The real estate industry right now in a seller's market is actually almost more difficult than it is in a balanced market. Meaning if I'm a buyer agent, typically when you get into real estate, you start off with buyers. I'm writing like five to 10 deals for every one I'm getting accepted because every deal is going in multiple offers for way over asking. So now let's play a game. Real estate agents are underpaid and overworked, right? Probably not something you think if you're the public, but let's pretend you are putting in three hours per offer minimum, right? So you're doing one showing, one analysis, writing one offer and presenting it. So let's say three hours, let's be conservative with it. Let's extrapolate that to, you know, five to 10 offers. So you're 15 to 30 hours invested 
and you're only getting one out of those deals. So now extrapolate that time investment versus the sales that you're getting, right? That, that's the first thing I would say. Now, here's the other side of that coin. When you do find some su success in real estate, you can start believing your own hype. And if you get in this business, you can stick with it for five years. You'll build a good reoccurring business where you probably don't have to go out and prospect a whole lot. So there is that, right? You do have to work really, really hard to get there and you have to follow up and do your job and be consistent and everything else. But once you get to that five-year point, it's a business that's weird because just by reciprocity, if you've done good work, one client's going to tell another client, your phone's just going to ring. Like we're lazy in this business. And agents, especially when they get to a high level, they start doing luxury new home construction and everything else. Man, they think, oh, I'm, the one, I'm the guy that runs this. I do it all. But you have to start with a day one mentality every single day. You have to wake up. You have to look at what you're doing, refine your skill set, see what value you're providing. And we're doing it right now. So we're super marketing heavy because I do believe attention is the one value that we have that's an intangible. You can't hire 10 other agents to do what we do because of the attention we've built up and the audiences, the production of the agency, but it's a seller's market. So I have to go beyond that for my builders and some of the other developers and new home construction buyers and luxury sellers and everything else, investors. And I got to go find inventory that it's off market. I have to be dialed into the market better than they are. I have to provide consultation and data and stuff they can't find on MLS or I'm going to get replaced with technology, right? So I'm just giving you my perspective as somebody that's in the industry that has a wicked team and people that are better than me supporting us to do the business we do. And I'm telling you, I don't believe my own hype, right? Tell me whatever you want about us. I'm day one today, literally talking to our admin team, day one, let, let's pretend we haven't done a single thing. What, what are our systems and processes, right? And I think this is where we really have to refine our craft every single day and have a day one mentality. Shout out to Glenn Lundy for that room this morning, that mindset. And I think the egos in the real estate industry really need to do a, a check on themselves. Look in the mirror, right? So we'll run through a couple things. If you're being disrespectful to other people in the industry because you think you're better than anybody else, you're not. Let me tell you that, right? And I can tell you the people in your industry don't think you are either. And it translates. And if you treat people like trash, the things they're going to say about you when you're not in the room are going to lead to you having more failure than success you could ever had. The second thing I'm going to tell people is don't believe the good pe things people say about you. So stop believing the hype of, oh my gosh, you're this, you're that, you, you dominate this market. And don't believe the bad things people say about you. You're spending too much time on this app or, you know, you're doing this or you're doing that, man. Like people don't know you unless they know you know you. And then allow people to come in and give you a little bit of insight into your world and audit people. I'll ask Kyle, I'll ask Matt, I'll ask Udelka and Judy and everybody else, you know, what I can improve on my communication skills. And I know they love me. I know they'll tell me the truth, right? Juan, same thing, man. I can ask you and say, you know, what did we do well in the last sale? What could I improve on? And if he tells me I didn't like this, I didn't like that. I'm not going to care. I'm not going to get my ego all wrapped up in it. Cause it's not about that. It's, you know, looking past your ego. So I went down a wormhole for that one. Um, if you're going to stick around for these lives, I can tend to do that. So give me feedback on what you like and what you don't like. I'll add and subtract as much as you want. I will do one more question. Oh, man. Da, 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 da. Hold on one second. There are so many questions. I'll get these reorganized for next, next week. Mm, I want a good one. I want a good one. Oh, here's a good one. Death and disclosures. So somebody passed away in a property, natural causes. Does it have to be disclosed? I'm not a lawyer. There you go. We're done. <laughs> I would definitely say, first of all, talk to your agent and your lawyers for every specific situation. Personally, I think everything should be disclosed because it just protects you. You're doing a real estate transaction. Thank you, Yudelka. It's a pretty cool development. Um, we're live on YouTube and everything else. That's a static shot, but I'll show you this as we get distracted. It's pretty cool. Um, I believe disclosures are the smartest thing you can do because you're protecting everybody throughout the entire process, right? Whether it's a small pinhole leak, whether it's a, you know, a death or suicide or something that happened in the property, the more you disclose, the better off you are. Now, people with disclosures treat it wrong. A lot of times in disclosures, people get freaked out and they think, Oh my gosh, you know, they're going to run from the property. It's going to dequalify them. It's all in the presentation, right? If you explain it in such a way that the disclosure is being done properly and you don't make it a big deal, it's not a big deal. I've seen houses that are teardowns, not a problem. Disclosure is done properly. Awesome. 
it's all about transparency. Now, the problem with disclosures is if you don't say something and then somebody finds something out down the road and it does impact the perceived value, whatever, the neighbor knew about it, the neighbor said that you knew about it, that's when you get into lawsuits. Now, from my research, my understanding is the natural causes don't necessarily need to be disclosed as well as you know some other aspects of death and murder and suicides. But I'm not going to answer that question here from the standpoint that it depends on where you're located, what province you're in, and the nature of what happened, right? I saw the, oh, sorry, hold on one second. I saw the whole taking advice from people, getting better every day, great purpose, how perfection would be preached. Okay, sorry, I apologize. I got distracted by the Instagram feed. Um, so we will wrap this up in a second. But yeah, on the disclosure side of things, the important thing for you to note is that truthfully, yes, in my opinion, I would always disclose it because I think it's, it's something that could impact you beyond the sale. And half of our job is to protect you beyond the sale. The reason you hire me versus Uncle Jimmy, who's going to tell you to bury it, is I don't want you getting a phone call in six years saying you should have disclosed this. And for this and this reason, you're now getting sued for $100,000 when it's something that maybe would have cost you two or three grand on a sale. So I would always say, yes, do it. But there's different laws in different states. So I can't really give you a specific answer on this one. And real estate fees. Maybe we can do an entire episode on that. No, we're done. So I'm going to cap this out. This was fun. I like doing these lives. Fire your questions on YouTube. Come find us on YouTube. Justin Conoco, drop any questions in this episode. We'll try and answer them on the next episode as this list builds. Appreciate this community so much. You guys are awesome. And I'll catch you guys next time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.